Today we're going to talk about uh, strategic planning and particularly strategic planning and humanitarian uh, response. The transformative agenda introduced a, uh, several new reforms to uh, the way humanitarian uh, response is uh, coordinated and one of the key elements of the transformative agenda was bringing in a, a, an enhanced emphasis on strategic planning. So I guess the first thing to do is to have a bit of a think about why we need a strategic plan. The simple answer is to keep us all aligned. As you know, out of 2005 humanitarian reform process, the coordination response was organised in terms of clusters which were arranged along sectoral lines. And so as part of the legacy of that first 2005 humanitarian reform, there's been somewhat of a fragmentation between the, uh, between the various sectors. This has made it particularly important that, they, that we introduce a system where there's some strategic alignment between the sectors. Because if you have a population that's affected by uh, a natural disaster or man-made disaster, it's critically important, and human, the humanitarian charter demands, that we focus our efforts on those in most need, that we follow the principle of targeting. But it doesn't make much sense if the wash sector targets one population, the food security sector targets another, nutrition targets yet another, and health targets another. In that way, we, uh, we don't get the maximum impact for the scarce resources that are available. So it's absolutely critical that we maintain some sort of strategic alignment. So that's why we do it. The next question is, what is a strategic plan? And if, although it's a term often used, one wonders how well understood it is. But a strategic plan is a roadmap towards a shared objective. So the whole concept of a strategic plan starts with the objective and the objective needs to be shared by all those participating in the strategy. So we start off with the strategic objective. The strategic objective is then elaborated in a little bit more detail in terms of outcomes. What are the situations that when they are present, will give you some assurance that the, uh, that the strategic objective was met. Another way of looking at these outcomes is to think of them as success criteria. So if I have an objective, how will I know when it's achieved? What are the circumstances that will be present when the objective is achieved? These, these are the outcomes that we're looking for. The next step is to think about how do we create the circumstances where those outcomes are present? And that's by putting certain things in place. And these are known as the outputs. So if we put the, if the outputs are present, the outcomes will be there. And when the outcomes are there, the strategic objective has been met. So the next stage of decomposition of the strategic planning process is the outputs. The next step is, is the projects or the activities. These are the things that we need to do in order to make sure that the outputs are delivered. So it's a series of activities. Uh, and in, certainly in the humanitarian sphere, the activities manifest themselves as projects. So for, this, uh, for the purposes of this little discussion, I'll call them projects. But they're, out, they're activities. The critical thing about this being a strategic plan is that there is a logical connection between the activities and the strategic objective. If you can't map a clear and logical process from one to the other, then you, you might have a plan, but it's not necessarily a strategic plan. So what you need to be able to see is that if these activities are undertaken, they will generate these outputs that will produce these outcomes, and when those outcomes are present, the strategic uh, objectives are met. What is not a strategic plan is people entering into the, uh, to the response to a humanitarian emergency and identifying a number of interventions that they see as being necessary uh, and identifying projects. A strategic plan could look very much the same as this, the, but the difference is critical. It's strategic if the logic flows this way, 
and it's not strategic if it starts from the projects because there, there is no logical way to go backwards, to, to start off with activities and see what outputs they would assemble to and see what outcomes they might aggregate to and try and create a strategic objective out of it. This, this is backwards planning uh, and this is uh, it's unstrategic and more intuitive. So the, the, the critical point to having a good strategic plan is that the logical process, the logical stepping from one stage to the other is very, very tight and that there's quite an amount of discipline introduced in moving from one to the other. So the first, the first requirement for a strategic plan is that it be strategic, that it be a logical progression from, from objective to activities. So let's take a bit of a look now at how that's supposed to work in, this, in the transformative agenda. The transformative agenda sets the responsibility for setting the strategic uh, objectives with the HCT. So we still, like any strategy, we need a coherent objective and it's the HCT that comes together in, in a given context, uh, a response in a particular country says, this is the objective that as a humanitarian community we want to achieve. So the strategic objective remains the same. And this is based on the information that's available, based on an assessment of where the vulnerabilities lie, and a decision. It's a conscious decision as to what the priority objectives are for the humanitarian community. I mean, we're used to emergencies where there are very, very large populations. Target populations well beyond the capacity of the humanitarian community to respond to all. There's a variety of needs. The needs don't fall evenly across all sectors. So there's a need for some very fair, very clear decision making. We said, these are the objectives. This is what we want to achieve. What happens then is that each of the sectors or clusters takes this specific objective as guidance and helps them elaborate their strategic operating framework. So you have a number of sectors responding in any uh, particular emergency and each is then required or needs to elaborate the strategic objective in a strategic operating framework. And this is done sector by sector, so all with the same strategic objective, you have each cluster developing their strategic operating framework. And the strategic operating framework takes the strategic objective and elaborates the outcomes and outputs and activities that are necessary within the context of that sector to assure progress towards the strategic objective. So what we have in a strategic operating framework, we have outcomes, outputs, and activities, which might be projects. In a cluster context where you have a number of partners whose efforts need to be coordinated, this is the essential coordinating mechanism. Partners receive from the HCT the strategic objective. They come together in their cluster, usually with the support of a strategic, opera, a strategic advisory group, a SAG. And the SAG, by a process of uh, analysis and discussion and debate, articulates the outcomes, outputs and activities. If we do these things, we get these outputs, we produces these outcomes, which is, in my case, WASH, the contribution to the strategic objective. And the logical connection between the strategic operating framework and the strategic objectives needs to be rock solid. Until the, there was a recognition of the importance and a response to the importance of the strategic objectives, the cluster strategic uh, operating frameworks were, were always uh, part of the humanitarian landscape, but they lacked the coherence to actually support the same objective. And there is a natural tendency for this work to go on insufficiently guided by the strategic objective. 
It also creates the obligation that the strategic objective produce genuine guidance. It's not much good for a strategic objective just to identify the, the priority sectors. We could do that before, I mean, we, we could do that, that doesn't provide guidance to the sectors as to what needs to be done. It's also not good enough for the strategic objective to be so vague as to constitute no guidance at all. A good strategic objective should talk about the priority population. It should talk about the priority circumstances that need to be achieved with the humanitarian response and needs to move away from just listing uh, the, the priority sectors or just being sort of uh, quite vague, saying the reduction of suffering and uh, loss of life. So there's, there's quite a bit of responsibility in setting the objective and there's quite a bit of discipline involved in setting the, uh, the correct framework that responds to that. When we come down to the activity level, this is where the work of the partners is aligned so that this alignment produces the combined impact that we're looking for with strategic planning. So there will be a number of activities. And there will be a number of activities under each of the outputs, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll just say we end up with a list of activities. And then as partners strategically align their contributions to the response, particular partners take responsibility for particular activities, particular activities, particular interventions, particular projects. Uh, they might be reasonably standard uh, uh, interventions, but they might be uh, defined by uh, a particular uh, geographic area. But in the end, the cluster coordinator needs to be comfortable that the priority activities are covered by the partners. And this is replicated across all the, uh, all the relevant uh, sectors. So we have activities. And we have partners who have identified particular activities that they will, uh, that they will undertake. So, and this is where we often get a bit of confusion, uh, particularly with the large UN agencies, where there is, there seems to be a, a duality of, uh, of strategy in a particular sector or in particular agencies. It's not unusual to go to a large emergency and find that there's a set of strategic objectives, but that there are agency response strategies. The reality of the strategic planning process is that you can't be working to two strategies at the same time. So there needs to, we need to exercise the discipline of having a single strategy. One of the things that's not really clearly understood all that well is how the agency strategy, which might be multisexual, fits in with the overall humanitarian strategy. And the way one can see that is, is with this sort of display, is that an agency operating in these four sectors should be able to see its agency strategy represented in the strategic operating frameworks of the uh, sectors in which they're active. It's not much good going through this process and having a, a multi-sectoral agency strategy over here which has its uh, origins in an, another, another set of thinking. So that is the, uh, the general approach uh, that we're taking in the WASH cluster in order to align partners around a coherent set of activities supporting a strategic operating framework which is aligned with the strategic objectives. The problem is, to do this it takes time and it takes information, it takes debate and it takes analysis. We all know that you can't wait the week or two that is about the minimum that it takes to do this well because it involves collection and analysis of information, uh, consideration and debate amongst the partners, uh, it requires matching of capacity with strategic activities and their strategic activities because there's a logical connection through this process to the strategic objective. It takes time to put all of that in place in a quality that's reliable. So what do you do until then? You can't bring the whole humanitarian community uh, and put it on hold while this process is being done in a, uh, a careful and well-researched manner. The reality of it is, is that 
at the moment of the onset, when the assessment starts, there is an intuitive response that starts. So the counterpart to a strategic response is the intuitive response. And this is the response that starts immediately. This is the response that we used to used to use uh, before we uh, started to move in, in, onto a more strategic basis. Intuitive responses are those that are done based on best intuition at the time, based on the information that you have. Now, in the reality of humanitarian response, the people making intuitive decisions are generally quite experienced, quite knowledgeable, uh, there is not such a diversity of uh, available responses as for an intuitive response to be completely um, inappropriate. So my point here is not to criticize the intuitive response, to recognize that it's a very important way of organizing the response until the, a strategic response can take over. So in the intuitive response, agencies take the field, they do assessments, they raise funds and they respond. And this, this, I mean, as long as we have humanitarian response, this will always be the process that takes place. Uh, we all know the defects of this. There's no guarantee that the, uh, the populations being responded to are those in most need. There's no guarantee that the responses in different sectors reinforce each other. And there's a, a loss of synergy that, that's available. So the, although this is something that needs to go on in the early days, it's not something that we want to have persisting in response for a long time. So what we need to do then is we need to recognize that the intuitive response and the strategic response are different that we need to get about a sensible process developing a strategic response while the intuitive response is going on and then migrating our activities. These response activities here need to migrate over here and be changed because it's not likely that all the intuitive response activities will, have, will be priority activities in a strategic response. One of the problems that we encounter in, in cluster um, strategy making, and why I've stressed in my earlier dis discussion why it's so important to be logically rigorous in moving from objective to outcome to output to activity, is that if you are an agency representative, the global wash advisor for a big NGO, and you are sitting in the strategic advisory group of the wash cluster in a response, and your agency has an intuitive response going on, there is an irresistible tendency to try and import your intuitive response activity to find a place for it in the strategy. And this is a completely unstrategic impulse uh, and we, we need to, to guard against that. Often it's driven by the fact that you've risen funds for the non-strategic activity and you have an obligation to the donor uh, to deliver that particular response activity even if it doesn't show up here. So you tend to manage your participation in the decision-making here in order to ensure that you have a home for your project. And that's wrong. We really need to recognize that this is just a temporary set of arrangements and this is where we really capture the synergies of uh, a strategic response. So, that's the story as far as I know. I hope you find this helpful, and I wish you well. Thank you.